for those that don't know the name Bill Gothard, mm-hmm. I think, cause we were both homeschooled. So I knew, and we were both, I think, raised evangelical. So mm-hmm. I, I, I was adjacent to that world, I think, because mm-hmm. I knew people like a, from a distance involved, but I yeah. wasn't directly involved. Mm-hmm. And I know some of our listeners may have heard the name, but just for folks clarity, who is Bill Gothard? Yeah. So Bill Gothard, he was somebody who came on the scene in the sixties and seventies, mm-hmm. seventies. He was promising a guarantee for families. He said, mm-hmm. if you follow my seven basic life principles, then your life will be a success. And all you have to do is to like, listen to these lectures. He had 60 plus mm-hmm. hours of basic seminar that you could listen to. And he said, if you do this, you're going to be a light to the nations. You're going to have the perfect family. They're all going to turn out well. You're going to be protected from, uh, your kids will be protected from the sexual revolution that's happening all around Mm -hmm. them. And they will grow up to, um, be mighty in spirit and to, like I said, lead nations. Mm -hmm. And so that was his promise and guarantee. And so a lot of parents in that time were freaking out Mm -hmm. because they were looking at the world around them. The rebellion of kids was Mm -hmm. so bad. And they just said, we need an answer. Mm -hmm. So it was crazy because Bill Gothard at that time, he started filling up massive stadiums. So he had Mm -hmm. thousands of people who would come. They would fill up these stadiums and he would teach them his basic life principle seminars. And, um, It was wild because I feel like even some, you know, like decently well-rounded good churches would go there. They would send their people there because initially the teaching started out where it had some good things. He had like a lot of good things to say. It seemed reasonable to a lot of people. It seemed so reasonable. And so they would like get hooked in his teachings, but then he very quickly started to add more teachings Mm -hmm. to where he would bind your conscience to something. So he'd say, I want you to make a vow before God that you will read your Bible for five minutes every day. Or I want you to um, make a vow to like a single service commitment to where you're not going to get married for so many years, whatever you feel the Lord lays on your heart. What happens if you accidentally break the vow of reading the Bible? Well, that's the thing. Because you're not supposed to, I mean, even the Bible says like, let your yes Yes. be yes and your no be no. Yeah. And it's scary. What if you get sick and- Totally. (laughs) I mean, that, would that mess with people, people's yes, heads? Yes, it would. Yeah. And that's that's the whole premise mm-hmm. of the teachings. They were all based in fear. And mm-hmm. so for me, as a young girl, I went to his seminar. At the age of 12, you could go. And so I went there and I made this commitment. And it was something that terrified me because immediately he said, after you made the commitment, he's like, don't you you know, forget to pay this vow that you made to God. If you do, he's like, it would have been better for you to like, not hear these teachings and to hear them and depart from them. And so it kind of like gripped you in fear. And then he would tell these stories about people who um, basically like it was superstitious stories about how, you know, like objects could cause people to like um, die. And like if, if, if you had a picture of a painting on your wall, this is one story he told. There was a woman who bought a ship painting. She hung it on her wall Well, her husband and three sons ended up dying at sea. So this pastor comes over, talks to her, and he's like, why do you think they died? And Bill Gothard is recounting the story. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't know. I'm like so heartbroken. And he said, it's the picture on your wall of the ship. And she's like, I didn't know. I didn't know that's what caused them to die. So like immediately take it out. And it's like, at what point do you think that that's actually helping people? But he would connect like superstition to things. And so he would have you make vows, but then he would say, if you Meaning have this- like superstition can be good, he it's was like, saying? He would say, it's like, that's what's going to cause. So a very simple cause and effect sequence. That's how we live our lives is by cause and effect sequences. And so um, whether it was a Cabbage Patch doll that you happen to have in your house, that could bring in evil spirits. Um, there were times where it was like, you know, just little things that he would come up with and he would say, now this is the new Mm -hmm. rule basically. And so you need to follow this. And if you don't, then you're going to bring damnation upon yourself. And it was a really scary way to live because once you make a vow to God, like then you do want to keep that. Mm -hmm. But it's just the way that it was done was not right. And it was in fear. And so that was, he was very comfortable placing burdens upon people that they couldn't carry um, and they couldn't fulfill. And I think that that was something that for many years, I, even as like I was, became a born again believer at the age of 14 and my life really changed. I wanted to love God. I wanted to obey him. 
But the thing that was hard for me was once I was a believer, I was like, okay, I really, I know all these rules. Like I know all that Bill Gothard wants me to do. And I would look at his teachings as the word of God. So then I like went more hardcore into it because I thought this is the way that I'm going to please God instead of just going. What did that look like to go more hardcore into Yeah. So just teachings. like abiding by his dress code standards. Mm-hmm. So um, I have journal entries and I put a couple of these in the book, but some I didn't. But there was one time I was like, oh, I'm so convicted about my modesty because my skirt is maybe when I sit down, it's not the right length below my knee and it needs to be, you know, so many inches. And like, I don't want to, you know, like I couldn't buy a sleeveless shirt, but I could roll my sleeves up in the sun. So like there are all these legalistic rules that he would put on you of things you can and can't do. So I basically just leaned heavily into that, like no drums and music, because then you're going to call demons. And so I was very careful. If I ever heard, you know, somebody turn on music with drums, I was just so afraid and I wanted to get away from it. And so I was like a rule follower to the max and just wanted to do what was right before God. But sadly, I was just following this man's teachings instead of realizing, wait, that's not what the Bible even says. Like Mm -hmm. I need to read it for myself Mm -hmm. and to disentangle um, the truth from the error and see what God's word actually says. At what point did you have this awakening of, okay, these rules are in the excess. I mean, we could call them fundamentalist, right? Yeah. Um, where you saw, whether it's the dress code of the skirt to a certain like long, long skirt, nothing sleeveless, mm-hmm. or it has to do even with the teachings on sex. And I want to get into that mm-hmm. in a minute because I see you know, we recently did a series at live action called the truth about sex, Mm -hmm. where we criticize obviously the sexual revolution, which Mm -hmm. is insanity, but then some of the reactions to Mm -hmm. it, which can be an excess. And that would be some of the excesses of purity culture. Mm -hmm. So, but I want to start with, um, your kind of awakening. Like what, at what point did you start to realize this is, this Mm -hmm. is not what God is asking of me. This is something that Bill Gothard is asking of me. Yeah. It actually took me so many years Um, it wasn't until I met my now husband, Jeremy, where I feel like I was able to actually question for the first time these teachings. And it kind of started out like in a trickle a little bit. Um, my brother-in-law married into the family and he had a little bit of different like theology than us. And so he basically like at their church, they would teach verse by verse through the Bible. So they were like, not just taking a topic and then Mm. teaching on it and making the Bible say whatever they wanted to say. So it was like helpful. He was handling the word of God in a very different way. So seeing that, it actually challenged me to read the Bible differently. So I started to see things in the Bible where I was like, okay, I didn't see that before, but it wasn't until Jeremy and I um, started talking. Um, It was- so when you were dating. We were right dating. We were technically courting in okay. our setting. So it was like we had to go through a very formal courtship process. Um, Jeremy talked to my dad for five and a half months before we could talk. Wow. Um, just about theology. And he had to have his How did you even approval. meet Jeremy? So I met Jeremy through my brother-in-law. That same brother-in-law I was talking about, Ben. Um, he introduced us. and.